Understanding the techniques used in rally driving will help you understand the relationship between car and road surface and how to be the master of control under extreme pressure. Dirt Rally has a precisely detailed vehicle handling model, so you will need to utilize real-world driving techniques to get through our most technical stages in one piece. Master these techniques and you'll maximize the potential of every car, allowing you to get better stage times and challenge for championship victories. Weight transfer is the core component that most aspects of rally driving revolve around. That is, the inertia of the car's weight as it changes direction. This is the force that makes your body move as the car brakes, accelerates and turns. Weight transfer affects the amount of mechanical pressure applied by each of the four tyres against the road surface. When a car speeds up, slows down or turns, each tyre will experience a difference in that mechanical pressure compared to when the car is stationary. This results in an increase or decrease of the potential grip available. Braking and accelerating produces longitudinal weight transfer and turning produces lateral weight transfer. It can also be influenced by other factors such as the road surface, jumps and crests. Always try and manage the weight transfer at the moment it's required, whether accelerating, braking or turning. This will maximise the grip potential of each tyre, keeping you flowing in and out of sections throughout a stage. It is important to bear this basic principle in mind as you watch these guides, as almost all these techniques are used to manage weight transfer. Like an aeroplane, rally cars move in three axes. Roll, pitch, and yaw. Rally cars are known for performing big slides. Most of the time, these slides are induced by the driver to achieve as high a speed through a corner as possible without sliding off the road. In order to traverse a rally stage quickly and without crashing, you must manage the attitude of the car at all times. In rallying, the racing line means the same as in any other form of motorsport. That is, to straighten the track as much as possible through corners. However, unlike some other forms of motorsport where drivers use every inch of the track to find the perfect racing line, rally drivers have only one shot at each corner, so they often leave a small margin for error. As a rally stage undulates through forests or curves around mountains, it is not always possible to see the racing line. Accurate pace notes are vital so that you know where to place the car on the road even if the section ahead is not immediately visible. You should also listen out for obstacles such as gateposts or piles of logs that may cause you to take a slightly different line through a corner than you otherwise would. When you're out on stage, make sure you listen to your co-driver and position your car appropriately for the road ahead. Always try and allow a small margin for error. When you hear drivers talking about maximum attack, they are talking about when they are pushing as hard as they can to get the most out of the car. This often leads to some of the most spectacular moments in rallying as drivers set stage records or push too far and have an event ending crash. Knowing when to push and when to be conservative are vital when competing in an event. If you're recovering from a mechanical issue and you're trying to make up time to the rest of the field, it may be a valid strategy to push harder as you have very little to lose. If you're in the top three and setting competitive stage times, it may be more sensible to take a conservative approach and avoid any big risks. In reality, drivers often take a measured approach, driving at 95% of their full potential so as not to make any big mistakes while still maintaining a competitive pace. In Dirt Rally, this measured approach is advisable as you get to grips with your car and how it responds to the stages and the conditions. If the front wheels of a car lose traction with the road surface while attempting to steer, the car enters a state known as understeer. Understeer is always bad and never intentionally used in any rally driving technique. In fact, some of these techniques are used specifically to avoid understeer. 
Understeer occurs if traction has been partially lost. The car will continue to corner, but at less of an angle than the direction of the front wheels. The car will feel like it is pushing forward. In this situation, applying more steering angle often makes the situation worse, as doing so requires even more traction than was initially being asked of the front tires. If the wheels have entirely lost traction, the car will cease turning and will slide in the direction it was traveling before the wheels locked. This is particularly common while steering under heavy braking, as the traction of the tire is being used partly to slow the car down and partly to turn. The correct response is to stop any input to the brake and accelerator and reduce the steering angle. This allows the weight of the car to settle and traction to be regained. On loose surfaces such as gravel and snow, there is an increased chance of understeer due to the reduced level of grip, so techniques are often used to induce oversteer to prevent the car from understeering in the first place. Front-wheel drive cars are particularly prone to understeer as all braking, accelerating and turning forces go through the front tyres. Understeer can occur while accelerating if the combined forces of accelerating and steering overcome the traction available. A similar loss of traction can occur due to braking and steering. Rear-wheel drive cars are least prone to understeer as the front tyres are only used to brake and turn. In fact, their characteristics are more prone to oversteer. Four-wheel drive cars tend to exhibit the characteristics of front-wheel drive cars under braking on corner entry and rear-wheel drive cars under acceleration on corner exit. Rally teams work hard to reduce these characteristics and give a more balanced setup. Remember, understeer is always bad. When rally driving, make sure you try and avoid it at all costs. If the rear wheels of a car lose traction with the road surface while attempting to steer, the car enters a state known as oversteer. This is when the angle of the car exceeds that of the steering input and the rear of the car steps out of line with the front. Unlike understeer, oversteer is often used as a technique to increase the speed at which corners can be taken. By proactively eliminating understeer, a higher exit speed can be achieved. How oversteer is induced and controlled depends on the type of drivetrain in the car. By definition, front-wheel drive cars do not have any drive to the rear wheels. Therefore, oversteer cannot be induced by applying the throttle, but can be induced by using weight transfer. Once a front-wheel drive car enters oversteer, the attitude of the car can be controlled by steering with opposite lock, accelerating, decelerating or braking. Applying opposite lock while accelerating will effectively speed up the front of the car and will bring the rear of the car back in line. If more oversteer is required, for example if the corner is tighter than expected, decelerating or braking will increase the amount of oversteer by maintaining the weight over the front wheels and therefore reducing the grip on the rear. As the rear wheels of a four-wheel drive vehicle are powered, you can also induce and maintain oversteer by using the throttle to spin the wheels. Depending on the ratio of power delivery between front and rear wheels, the car may have a tendency to oversteer more or less on corner exit. If the ratio is biased towards the front, under acceleration the car may pull itself out of oversteer. However, if the ratio is biased toward the rear, applying power may increase oversteer by spinning the rear wheels. Subtle control of the steering, throttle and brake is used to initiate, maintain and exit oversteer and the same weight shifting techniques apply to four-wheel drive as for front-wheel drive cars. Unlike front and four-wheel drive cars, rear-wheel drive cars require the opposite technique with regard to throttle control during oversteer. Oversteer can be induced and maintained by weight transfer but also by applying power to brake the traction of the rear wheels. Once oversteer has been initiated, continuing to apply power will maintain the slide. In order to limit or correct oversteer, throttle input must be reduced. Lift-off oversteer occurs when, during cornering, you lift off the throttle.
Because the car is slowed by engine braking, there will be a certain amount of longitudinal weight transfer, which will unload the rear tyres, causing them to partially lose traction with the road. In a front-wheel drive car, this weight transfer alone is enough to induce oversteer, because the front of the car is usually heavier than the rear. In four-wheel drive and rear-wheel drive cars, although the difference in the static weight between the front and rear may not be as great as a front-wheel drive car, the effect is amplified by engine braking also acting on the rear wheels as they are unloaded by the weight transferring forward. The key thing to remember is that oversteer is used as a technique to increase the speed at which corners can be taken. You may be tempted to try and avoid using the brakes as much as possible, but there are two separate and equally important uses for the brakes in a rally car. The most obvious use is to slow down to a speed at which the car can take the next corner without crashing. The second, less obvious reason is to manage weight transfer before, during or even after cornering. Applying the brakes transfers more of the weight of the car over the front wheels, pressing the tyres against the road, giving them increased grip. The trade-off is that the rear tyres have less of the car's weight applied to them, resulting in less grip. Slowing the car down should only be done while the car is moving in a straight line. All four wheels don't need to be pointing forward, but the direction of travel should be as straight as possible. You should apply the maximum braking force without the front wheels locking. Depending on the corner you are approaching, you may need to partially lock the rear wheels to induce oversteer. Judging braking points correctly allows you to brake smoothly and continuously until the turn-in point, where you can release the brake and turn for the corner. Releasing the brake at the turn-in point means that the weight will have already been transferred to the front wheels when you turn, giving increased traction. You must always take the characteristics of the car and the road into account when braking. As well as the level of grip and characteristics of the road, many other factors can affect weight transfer. This can load or unload each tyre, affecting the amount of grip available and the distance required to slow down. Some examples are as follows. When travelling uphill, the effect of gravity working against the car results in shorter braking distances. The opposite is true when travelling downhill. When braking on a loose surface, reduced grip results in longer braking distances. The level of grip is often variable from corner to corner, so it is usually prudent to leave a margin for error. When braking on clean, dry tarmac, you will have shorter braking distances, as there is generally more grip, the car will tend to remain more stable than on loose surfaces. Conditions such as wet weather, mud on the road or ice will result in longer braking distances. The overall weight of the car has a dramatic effect. Heavier cars take much longer to slow down than lighter cars. If the wheels are inadvertently locking during braking, the wheels will slide across the surface rather than slowing the car down. So remember, use the brakes to slow the car down to a speed at which it can take the next corner without crashing and to manage weight transfer before, during or after cornering. Always be aware of the road conditions and adjust your braking distances accordingly. The term left foot braking is often misunderstood as simply using your left foot rather than your right foot to operate the brake pedal. While that fact is true, it only scratches the surface in explaining the technique. If braking, accelerating and steering are the tools used to manage weight transfer, left foot braking is the tool for fine adjustment. Using your left foot on the brake pedal and your right foot on the accelerator has a number of advantages. The amount of time taken between pressing the accelerator and brake pedals is significantly reduced compared to using your right foot only. This means that fractions of a second are saved every time you swap from accelerating to braking and back again. 
If you apply a small amount of brake force while accelerating, particularly in a front-wheel drive car, the load that the engine and drivetrain has to work against causes the differential to tighten. This spreads the power across both wheels, making it less likely to spin one of those wheels due to low grip, therefore giving you more driving traction out of corners. Weight transfer can be fine-tuned mid-corner by adjusting the amount of brake force versus the amount of throttle applied. A little more brake input transfers weight forward, giving more traction on the front wheels to help the car turn in. A little more throttle corrects oversteer if the car is sliding too much. The car can be balanced at the edge of traction throughout a corner using this method. Brake balance adjustment can be used in conjunction with left foot braking to tune the balance between understeer and oversteer. Some of these principles still apply if you use your right foot on the brake, but clearly the speed at which you can move between pedals becomes a factor. Cars that require the clutch to be engaged in order to change gear usually prevent the use of left foot braking for slowing the car down from high speed. However, the technique can still be applied through a corner. Remember, left foot braking allows you to quickly switch between acceleration and braking and is a fantastic technique for fine tuning the weight transfer of the car. Tires operate at their optimum with a certain amount of wheel spin. On gravel, wheel spin lets the tread of the tire move the loose material on the road surface and puts the tire in contact with the harder surface underneath, where the most grip can be found. However, excessive wheel spin prevents the tires from achieving their maximum grip potential, and so it's not always appropriate to floor the accelerator. The technique used to combat excessive wheel spin is known as feathering the throttle and is used primarily when exiting a corner to achieve maximum grip and therefore acceleration. Instead of using the accelerator pedal as an on-off switch, you can modulate the throttle input to find the most grip. The amount of throttle input required to do this will vary from surface to surface and even from corner to corner, so it is more a case of feeling for the grip than knowing exactly how much throttle to apply. As with braking, the inclination of the road ahead has an impact on the speed at which a car can accelerate. When travelling uphill, the car has to pull its weight against gravity and will accelerate more slowly than on a flat surface. Travelling downhill will allow the car to accelerate more quickly. Perhaps less obvious is the effect of altitude on the car. At high altitude, such as the mountain ranges that rally stages and hill climbs often traverse, the car will have relatively less power than at lower altitude. Engines need air to burn fuel, and so if more air goes in, more fuel can go in and more power can be produced. As the air density reduces with altitude, power output also reduces. Bear this in mind when you are driving up Pikes Peak, as the change in altitude is one of the most dramatic in motorsport. As with braking, weight transfer is an extremely important aspect of making a rally car turn. Simply turning the steering wheel does not guarantee that the car will move in the desired direction. As a driver, you must ensure that the weight is transferred to the correct place at the correct time. In general, the weight should be transferred to the outside front wheel relative to the direction of the corner. Braking places the weight of the car over the front wheels, but other factors should be considered, such as the current attitude of the car and the characteristics of the road. The current attitude of the car will vary depending on the section of road ahead. Two corners in the same direction will mean that the weight will already be in the correct place to take the second corner after the first. With two corners in opposite directions, you will have to make sure that the weight is transferred to the other front wheel after the first corner before the car will change direction for the second. The rate at which the weight transfers in any direction is dependent on the surface, the available grip and the setup of the car. In sequences of corners that change direction, you can use the pendulum effect to help the car change direction from one corner to the next. 
crests, jumps, dips and other obstacles can all destabilise the car and stop you from transferring the weight to the correct wheel and so these factors need to be taken into account. Making sure that the weight is transferred to the correct place at the right time is one of the most important aspects of rally driving so make sure you keep this in mind at all times. There is a common misconception that to drive a rally car quickly, you need to wrestle the steering wheel one way, then the other, as much as possible. When you turn the steering wheel, you are transferring the weight of the car to the wheels on the side where it's needed to load the suspension and provide traction for turning. If you rapidly move the weight from one side to the other, it is likely to destabilize the car, making it difficult to control. Continuing the soaring action on the steering wheel will progressively make the situation worse until either a crash or a spin has occurred. When cornering or making corrections to the steering, you should apply the minimum amount of steering necessary. In conjunction with other techniques, such as left foot braking to induce oversteer, the amount of steering input necessary may be considerably lower than would be required for the same angle corner in a road car. As well as keeping the car as stable as possible, using the minimum amount of steering takes the least time to apply and then remove. Consider a situation where the car unexpectedly and significantly oversteers. If you were to apply a lot of opposite lock, it may correct the situation. However, the rear wheels may suddenly grip, snapping the car out of oversteer, and you may have to rapidly unwind the opposite lock in order to prevent the car from transferring into oversteer in the other direction. Excessive steering lock would only serve to make this situation more difficult to control. So remember, always try to use the minimum amount of steering input possible in conjunction with other techniques to make sure the car remains as stable as possible. The handbrake turn is used in rallying more than in any other form of motorsport. The aim of performing a handbrake turn is to get the car to dramatically oversteer at relatively low speed, which enables a tighter turn to be taken than using the steering axis of the wheels only. Weight shift is still required, and you must use the momentum of changing direction with the steering in conjunction with the handbrake to get the rear of the car to slide. The handbrake can also be used to induce oversteer in a more open corner if there is insufficient traction on the front wheels to get the car to turn in at the required point. Remember, handbrake turns are used to navigate very tight corners such as hairpins that would be difficult or slow to drive around normally. So listen out for these types of corners in the pace notes. Pendulum turns are probably the most advanced technique used in rally driving. They are essentially the culmination of all the techniques we have described in these guides. They are used specifically to prevent the car from understeering on loose surfaces when approaching sharp turns or hairpins at relatively high speed. The technique works by using the momentum of the rear of the car swinging from one direction to the other. It must be timed correctly so that the final weight shift happens at the turning point for a corner. Modern rally teams put a lot of effort into reducing their car's tendency to understeer so pendulum turns are not used as much in today's cars as they were with the classics. In order to explain the process, here are the inputs you should make and the effect it will have on the car at each point during a pendulum turn. In this example, the car is travelling at high speed on a straight piece of gravel road and has to make a 90 degree turn. As you arrive at the braking point, you get hard on the brakes to slow the car down and shift the weight of the car forward. With increased grip on the front wheels, Flip the steering wheel in the opposite direction of the corner. The reduced weight over the rear wheels will put the car into oversteer with the rear of the car stepping out and the front of the car pointing away from the corner. You can now increase your throttle input, reduce your braking input and steer in the direction of the corner before modulating all three inputs. This allows you to maintain the oversteer until the point at which the car needs to turn in for the corner. It's worth noting that the lateral grip of the tyre combined with some braking input causes the car to rapidly decelerate as if braking hard in a straight line. 
Now release the brake pedal and feather the throttle. This will snap the car out of oversteer in the initial direction. The momentum of the weight shift of the rear of the car, coupled with the acceleration and steering input, will initiate oversteer in the direction of the corner. At the turning point, apply full throttle and move the steering wheel in the same direction as the rear of the car. This is the pendulum part. You want the car to oversteer in the direction of the corner to help eliminate understeer. Now feather the throttle as the car is switching from oversteer one way to the other. You must move the steering wheel in the same direction in order to catch the second slide. You will now have oversteer through the corner. Keep feathering the throttle and control the oversteer with opposite lock. A perfect Scandinavian flick will see you hitting the apex and accelerating through the corner exit where the car is straight once more. Remember, this is an advanced technique and practice makes perfect. The advantage is that by deliberately using the momentum of the rear of the car, you can actively prevent the car from understeering into a tight corner. One of the most unique aspects of rallying, unlike other forms of motorsport, is that you have to contend with many kinds of road surfaces. With varying surface types and conditions come varying grip levels. Tarmac, concrete, gravel, dirt, ice and snow and their many variations are all surfaces you will have to get to grips with. While you will be given the most suitable tyres for the conditions in dirt rally, it is important to understand their characteristics. Not to be confused with the camber that is associated with suspension geometry, camber of the road surface should be taken into account, particularly when cornering. Positive camber, where the road is sloped towards the inside of the corner, can help the car maintain traction and higher cornering speeds can be achieved. Adverse camber, where the road surface is sloped away from the inside of the corner, tries to force the car away from the apex and the racing line, so lower speeds are often required. Although most corners have positive camber, a series of corners changing from one direction to the other, where the camber of the road also changes can be challenging, and you must ensure that the car gets out of the apex of one corner, over the crown of the centre of the road, and into the apex of the next corner. In some extreme cases, the camber is so severe that the car will jump across the road as it moves from one side to the other. Make sure you place the car in the correct position on the road so that you are making the most of the camber. Jumps are often the most spectacular part of any rally stage, but you must consider several factors when approaching them. Firstly, since the wheels of the car will not be in contact with the ground for a period of time, you will be unable to change direction or slow down while airborne. This sounds like an obvious point, but it means that you must ensure that the car leaves the ground with the correct attitude and correct speed in order to land in the correct place. If the road is straight, then it might simply be a case of making sure the car leaves the road while also pointing straight. But if the jump happens to be in the middle of a corner, you will need to ensure that the trajectory of the car will land back on the road. This is particularly important when there are ditches, rocks, trees or other obstacles lining the side of the stage. Weight transfer also plays an important role when approaching a jump. Depending on the nature of the road either side of the jump, may be a need to slow down or even break before it. Imagine approaching a jump at high speed, which has a sharp corner immediately after it. You would need to break before the jump to reduce the speed, which would transfer the weight of the car over the front wheels. In general, it is advisable not to have the car in this attitude as it leaves the ground over a jump, as it would be likely to nosedive and land hard on the front, which could result in damage to the sump, radiator or suspension. Instead, you should brake up to the lip of the jump, but stop braking just before you take off to move the weight back to the centre of the car. In some cars, especially front-wheel drive or other cars that are nose-heavy, it may even be prudent to be accelerating as the car leaves the ground. 
Doing this will transfer the weight to the rear just before takeoff, which will further help prevent the car from nose diving. Remember, even though big jumps at high speeds can be spectacular, taking them at the highest speed possible may not be the quickest way to tackle a jump. The longer a car is airborne, the more it slows down, so you should consider taking a jump at a slightly lower speed to get the wheels back on the ground as soon as possible. Although seemingly innocuous, crests can dramatically impact the stability of the car. Even if the car doesn't leave the ground as it would over a jump, a crest can often cause the car to go light and unload the suspension and tyres, resulting in reduced traction. This is particularly important if the crest is immediately before, during or after a corner, and they should be taken into account when approaching them. The other thing to consider is that depending on their size, they can prevent you from seeing the road ahead. Again, this is particularly important if the crest is immediately before a corner. Imagine approaching a crest which you cannot see over at high speed that is immediately before a slight corner. It is essential that you put the car in the correct place on the road and at the right attitude to take the corner, even though the corner cannot be seen until the last second. Bumps can also unload the suspension and tyres, reducing traction by flicking the front, rear or one side of the car upward. Rally stages are usually uneven surfaces, but particularly bad bumps that unsettle the car or require you to do something different than you otherwise would are often called out in the pace notes. Bumps don't always stretch across the entire width of the road, and so evasive action may be necessary, such as moving to one side of the road. Dips or other compressions in the road surface can be unpredictable and should be treated with caution. Dips that occur over a long distance may not have too big an impact on the car, but those that are shorter can act like a severe bump as the suspension is compressed and then rapidly extended, causing the car to be flicked into the air. Extra caution needs to be taken when traversing extremely rough terrain with many bumps and dips that can unsettle the car. Care should also be taken when crossing water splashes as they can, like dips and bumps, be unpredictable. Depending on the depth of water and the width of the crossing, the approach may change from flat out to slowing right down and just driving through it at a normal road speed. Hitting deep water at high speed can damage the front of the car, and so it is often better to lose a few seconds by slowing down than losing minutes with mechanical damage. Remember, this is why bumps, dips and water splashes are called out in your pace notes and where listening to your co-driver is extremely important. There are many types of obstacles that may be encountered on a rally stage. On a gravel stage through a forest, it is not uncommon to come across logs, branches or large rocks. Rally cars have strong sump guards and other underbody protection, and in gravel setup, the suspension travel and tough tyres allow the car to drive over most obstacles. Evasive action may need to be taken if the obstacle is large enough to damage the car or cause a crash. Lower suspension setups with shorter travel and lower profile tyres like those used in tarmac rallies mean that more care must be taken when making the split second decision to drive over or around obstacles. Fixed obstacles such as gate posts, bridge parapets and cattle grids often require consideration and are therefore included in the pace notes with sufficient description to allow the driver to pass them safely. Make sure you are prepared to take the necessary precautions to avoid a rally ending incident when you hear these obstacles called out. Unlike a race circuit where drivers learn every inch of the track, rally drivers tackle hundreds of kilometers of unique road during every rally and so in order to be fast and safe, they use pace notes. Not all pace notes are the same. Which system is used, 
and what features of the road are called out are down to driver preference and can vary greatly from one driver to the next. There are many variations of co-driver systems used, but in Dirt Rally we use 6 to 1, made famous by the legendary man himself, Colin McRae. In this system, 6 is the fastest, least severe corner and 1 is a slow, almost 90 degree corner. We then have square, hairpin and acute to describe even tighter corners. There is a general misconception that the number relates to the gear you should be in, but this isn't always the case. If you come out of a right 2 in 2nd gear immediately into a left 6, you are unlikely to change straight into 6th gear. Distances are generally given in metres, for example 60, 80 or 100, unless the corners are really close together, in which case AND or INTO may be used. Additional description of detail in the road ahead is also necessary. Calls such as care, caution and double caution signify sections where extra care should be taken. Descriptions such as open, tighten or double tighten are used when the angle of the corner changes midway through. Corner length is also described using half long, long or continues for. Crests, bumps and jumps, as well as other variations that you can drive through such as bad camber, dips and water splashes are also called out. Perhaps the most important calls of all are those telling you when an obstacle is present, meaning that you should avoid cutting the corner or running wide on corner exit. In these situations the co-driver will call don't cut. It is vitally important that you listen to your co-driver and don't cut in these situations. Another important aspect of pace notes is the timing. This is the point at which the co-driver delivers the note to you, relative to the position on the road. Again, this is down to preference, but it is common for the pace notes to be delivered one or two corners ahead of where the car is on the road. This allows you to build up a mental picture of the road ahead, so that you can put the car in the correct attitude at the correct time to achieve maximum speed. While some drivers prefer pace notes to be delivered later than others, it is critical that you are given each note before the point at which you would need to react to them. The most obvious example of that would be a breaking point for a corner. If the pace note is given to you after the point at which you would need to break, particularly for a corner that cannot be seen on approach, this is a late note. Many crashes in rallying have been caused by the co-driver not giving the driver the pace note in time. If you want to, you can adjust the co-driver call timing in the player preferences menu so that the calls are delivered with the timing that suits you.